should about wrap it up, except we'll take a quick uh, one-liner from everyone to honor our Dalton Moore Super Chat. Did you guys grow up Ohio State fans? Kevin, how'd that happen? Actually, I didn't. I'm from the West Coast. I grew up as a USC fan. Um, when I was 16, moved to the East Coast outside of Boston. Still really didn't have a strong collegiate allegiance. I was set to go to Pepperdine. A uh, funny thing happened in terms of the tech burst, uh, bubble bursting, and my dad uh, getting a job in Ohio, and I ended up at Ohio State, and the rest, as they say, is history. I'd Steve. say yes. I grew up in Circleville, 20 miles south of Columbus, and Ohio State was all you really knew. You know, growing up as a kid, it was the pro team in Columbus. Obviously, you didn't have anything else. And uh, you got to watch all the basketball games and three of the football games a year. So, really, I was probably more in tune with Ohio State basketball, really, than I was this mythical Ohio State football thing that you could only follow if you listened to the radio for whatever reason. Tell it. Tony, I can hear you in the back of your head right now saying, television bad, television bad. You know, that's how football embraced television in the 1970s. They did not want to cannibalize the live gate. And think about it. You had people paying three and four and five dollars for these tickets in the 70s, maybe 10 bucks by the end of the 70s. I don't know. And, and a full house is like seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars And they didn't want to cannibalize that because they didn't think there was any money in television. Lo and behold, once they turned on the faucet of that television money, the, they've never stopped it. So it's just gone up and up and up and up and up and up and, and really created interest in our sport that we've never could have imagined. I mean, when you think about we're all full-time employees of websites that cover Ohio State college football is pretty amazing. And uh, with no end in sight, I mean, this is not something where, um, you know, we see uh, people in other uh, walks of even within our fraternity of people who cover sports that are losing their jobs or whatever doesn't feel or seem like uh, the interest in what we do is going to change uh, anytime soon and you know knock on wood obviously for that had they not played the 2020 season you know maybe that would have impacted some of our livelihoods but uh, just kind of goes to speak of what the phenomenon is of college football and of course I went to Ohio State as well and uh, got my degree from Ohio State. But at the same time, I feel like uh, none of that stops me or deters me from covering it as zealously as I possibly can. So that's kind of where I'm at today. I low these many years later. You know, even in the late 80s and early 90s, Ohio State football, I think, was only allowed to be on TV like five times. That was like a national limit because of you just didn't want to, as Steve said, didn't want to eliminate the gate or get into that or – yeah, I think there may have also been like NCA rules about it's it's unfair, unfair, and so yeah, I in the, I grew up in Northwest Ohio and got to see much more basketball, and plus in the eighties and nineties, the early nineties, the basketball was better than the than the football anyway. So that's that's what we gravitated to, and you know, I grew up with watching Dennis Hobson and then giving giving way to Jimmy Jackson, and those were the that that's a heyday of Ohio State sports for me was watching. That was the best the Big Ten's ever been as well in basketball, in my my opinion, the early 90s. And so that's what I grew up with. And then, uh, yeah, went to Ohio State. And, and as, as Steve said, when you're covering it and you're watching the sausage get made, you know, the, the, the fandom can kind of go to to the wayside because you got a, you got a job to do, especially in a market that is as competitive as this one. I mean, you can't I – mean, it's, it's, it's difficult, but, I mean, the, the – the uh, the the attention is there and the desire to consume all of it is there as well. Yeah, just a quick history lesson for all the young people out there. Up until 1983, the NCAA bargained for all the schools, and you only got a couple of games each week on television, and they'd rotate the top schools. Well, Georgia and a few other schools sued the NCAA and said you were restraining the trade. And so they created a couple other TV packages that came on. But even then, the Big Ten, we didn't get full seasons of games covered until the mid-90s. Uh, they had a Raycom local package in Ohio that did like the ESPN Plus games. You had an ESPN package and an ABC package, and that was it. So three of the five or six games each week would be on TV, and the other two were 
you know, you had to go to the game if you wanted to see it, or like Channel 34 in Columbus would show a replay. The last game Ohio State played, to my recollection, that there was no live television was 1997. I think it was against Bowling Green uh, or Minnesota, one or the other that year. And uh, our friend Clay Hall got in trouble that Minnesota game. <laughs> they were showing a very important Penn State-Michigan game on ABC that day in the same time slot. And Channel 10 had paid the rights uh, to the Big Ten to show a tape delay of the game at like 10 or 11 o'clock later that night. Well, Clay and his photographer were shooting highlights of the game at Minnesota as it happened, walking out into the parking lot, getting on the satellite truck and sending them back to the studio. And during station breaks of the Penn State Michigan game, they were showing highlights of what had just happened in the Minnesota game. Uh, back in uh, Minneapolis, and they they dropped a lightning bolt on Clay's head like, you will stop. Channel 10 saw that pop up on the screen at their studio, and they were like, no. And you know who Clay's killing, producer was? At least our tape delay. You know who's Clay's, produ who's Clay's producer was those days? This guy. <laughs> yeah, you were probably right in the middle of that. But I do remember that. Clay, the SID from Minnesota, came up to Clay and said, you absolutely will stop this, or you have to leave. And, uh, you know, that that's where we were in the 90s, man. It was hit or miss. But and then obviously with the Big Ten Network in 07, 2007, every game everywhere is on television. Now, there's some non-conference basketball that maybe a team will go on the road and it has to be a webcast or something goofy. But ordinarily, everything's on TV now. Well, we were 20 some years away from TikTok or whatever, so we just didn't uh, didn't have ways to broadcast stuff ourselves or or or, or whatnot. But uh, hell, you know, in the Big Ten and its infinite wisdom, you know, only sent one team to bowls up through through '73. I mean, that great documentary on BTN tiebreaker or whatever. So uh, yeah, uh, it, people just can't. I mean, and granted, I was two when that all that happened, but. Uh, you know, we're we're only a couple generations removed from like the great vast wasteland of uh of, of broadcasting when it comes to uh, collegiate athletics. I'm pulling up schedules as you guys are talking because as soon as Tony mentioned that there was only about five games broadcast, because my recollection was like Steve pointed out about three games on that my first recollection of Ohio State football was me shaking my fist at the TV screen at six years old, watching Bo Schembechler get ridden off on his player's shoulders after beating Ohio State in Columbus 22-0 in 1976. And, and uh, you know, and that that became my, um, kind of my, my just staple move for the next 20 years was shaking my fist within inches of the TV screen when I would get upset with somebody. So Bo Schembechler over the next 15 years became my most hated villain in sports. But, um, you know, it just seemed to me like in 80, 81, and eh, maybe 82, three, four, five, and in that range, like the floodgates just, just opened up with all this football. But I'm going back and looking at these schedules because I'm thinking, I remember all these games, but I'm looking at them and I'm trying to, and I can recollect pretty well what games I watched on TV. And Tony, I think you're pretty got it got it pretty well down to about five games there in the late '80s that I'm looking at and thinking at because I, I get them mixed up because of what Steve talked about. I would watch them on Channel 25, 29 yep. on PBS at, at midnight that night, and I watch all the games, but I just watched them eight hours later. So I've got a recollection of them all. It was just I was watched them, you know, with Paul Warfield doing the. Uh, color analysis, uh, you know, eight hours later. Well, we, we would watch them and up north. Northwest Ohio would be on Bowling Green's PBS channel Sunday mornings. Uh, so we would watch that. And uh, that's how we had to watch the Minnesota comeback because we turned it off when it was live the, the day before in, what, 88. Um, and that, that, was a, that was always a classic one. Yes. I know uh, one of the ones I'll throw in uh, early 80s, it was a Maryland-Miami game where I think Maryland came back from down 31 points. Frank Reich I think, was the quarterback, and they beat Miami. And I'm not sure if there was live television for that or not, but USA Network, I recall, was in the college football business for a little while, and they played the replay on, like, Monday, and everybody had to watch the replay of that game to see how that happened because you didn't get to see it, I guess, 
on Saturday. I don't know. Maybe they had a, their contract was we can do replays, you know, or whatever, but um, not sure if that was covered live or not, but I do remember that one sticking out as uh, again, it was a, it was kind of a wild West. Once they got that lawsuit in the NCAA kind of was driven into submission by its members had to sue the NCAA to say, look, there's TV money out there. Let us go get it. And uh, the NCAA, you know, was a collection of the members to begin with. And they had to capitulate. I mean, the NCAA president thought he was the commissioner of college sports, and he really wasn't. I think the the guys who have uh, come along in that job now are much more politically uh, savvy to know that I cannot step on the toes of, you know, the Big Ten Conference, the ACC, the SEC, or I won't have this job very long. Uh, now, whereas back then they thought they were running their own fiefdom. So, um, you know, it, it kind of the schools grabbed. That was one of the first times the schools gathered together and grabbed control back from the NCAA and said, no, that was good in the 50s and 60s when we were building the sport. We're selling out our stadiums now. No problem. We need the TV money to pay for a new practice facility and new library and et cetera. So, yeah, that's where it came to.